I feel like they gave us our one break that we're going to get. Okay. Um, so I think it is going into effect after the 2020 year. So there's no more break. Now it's just giving the private companies a chance to really get their arms around the leases they have, the agreements they have, and um, take a very proactive approach, which is what we're doing here. Mm -hmm. okay. From Rain Associates Studio, this is Unsuitable, a management financial services podcast for entrepreneurs, tenured business leaders, and others who are ready to look beyond the suit and tie culture for meaningful, measurable results. I'm Doug Hauser. Don't you just hate it when you get used to doing something one way and then something unexpected comes along and flips your world upside down? Well, that's what's happening in the world of lease accounting. While the Financial Accounting Standards Board's Accounting Standards Codification Topic 842, that's a mouthful, won't actually impact companies until 2021, as always, there are steps businesses should be taking now to prepare. Carrie McElroy and Cody Neese here today are leading up Ray's internal ASC 842 task force in an effort to ensure that the transition is as smooth as possible for our clients. Today, the duo is going to help us understand the subject of lease accounting a little bit better while explaining why the change is taking place, how it will affect businesses, next steps, and more. Welcome to Unsuitable, Carrie and Cody. Thank you. We generally don't say 842, but 842. Okay. Well, <laughs> good to know. See, I'm already <laughs> learning something. <laughs> uh, yes, it's it's uh, glad to, uh, to have you to talk about this topic. Um, being in the construction segment, I get this question quite a lot from clients. What's this new lease accounting standard and why why are we doing this? And of course, you can explain Yeah, that. absolutely. So I think with any standard change, what we're trying to do as a profession is to really provide transparency to our end users. Mm -hmm. With leases, it's always been a lot of it is off the books. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of long-term leases that aren't necessarily presented. So what this is doing is bringing the lease liability, both long-term on the books, but as well as recording what's called a right of use asset. Mm -hmm. So whether it's a building, whether it's a piece of machinery, you'll have the associated asset as well as the liability on your books. Oh, and that's gosh. kind of a high, high level. Which makes sense, as I have, have been in my past career a third-party user of financial information as a as a banker. You know, we had clients that always tried to structure things as operating leases mm -hmm. back in the day to keep those off the financial statements. But as you say, ultimately, it is an obligation that the company still has to fulfill. So mm -hmm. I want to see that if I'm another third-party user, right? Is that the kind of the genesis definitely, here? Definitely, definitely. You know, really showing those liabilities, what's going to be owed into the future periods mm -hmm. um, so people can make well-informed decisions. So uh, Cody, from, from your perspective, we, we got a sense of kind of why it's, it's changing. How will this affect clients uh, going forward? You know, as Carrie mentioned, you're going to have the right of use asset mm -hmm. as well as the lease liability. Um, along with that, the liability will be split out between a current liability and a long-term liability. Mm -hmm as opposed to the right of use asset, will, which will just be a long-term liability. So long-term asset. Right? Long -term, yeah, long-term yes. asset, yes. Um, so from a client's perspective, uh, you mentioned your banking industry. Right. Uh, one impact um, you're going to see is uh, potential debt covenants. Right. So you have the additional current liability without the corresponding current assets. So um, a lot of the, the biggest issue or the biggest covenant affected will be the current ratio. Mm -hmm. um, I would not say that's used as much anymore as it maybe it was in the past, but uh, debt to net worth um, ratios will be affected and even debt service coverage ratio, which you see a little bit more, will yeah. be affected. And I know in the construction world, from my own perspective, working capital is probably one of the, the biggest measures that is looked at externally, either by the financing provider or the bonding company. Uh, lots of things are determined based on a multiple of working capital. And as you say, if I all of a sudden have now a, a current liability and no corresponding current asset, um, that can change that. So the best practice would be have those conversations with those know. users, right? Yeah, definitely. I mean, your operations aren't changing. The way you're doing business isn't changing. So being up front, 
with your lending institutions, having those conversations now, I mean, you're going to be better off uh, a year from now when yeah. that first quarterly covenant comes along. Now, this goes into effect, if if I'm right, is it for any fiscal year after 12, 15, 20? Is yes. that correct? Yes. We were very fortunate as mm-hmm. a leads team a few months ago, the FASB did extend that deadline. Okay. Just due to all the work that's involved with the smaller businesses, a lot of feedback from public companies and the resources that they've had to use in order to implement the standard. So they really listened and pushed back the implementation dates. Good. So although there's an <laughs> extra year, um, it's a lot of work. Um, it's pulling out your contracts. It's pulling out, looking at your lease agreements, but also looking at contracts that may have embedded leases in it. Okay. Um, doing that analysis, finding a way, putting new processes in. Mm. So it's just, it's just not a quick, Yeah. we'll get this done in a month and we're good to go. Yeah. So you not, really got to consider what all you need to do. Not that simple. So you mentioned like embedded leases and, and examining current contracts. So Cody, what, what are your, what do you say would be like best practices in terms of trying to go through all that? Do you start working with your CPA now to, to understand those, those things? Yeah, absolutely. We, we recommend, I guess there's a couple part process. The first part is, you know, your standard leases, your mm. um, maybe buildings, uh, vehicles, equipment, um, kind of get those listed out and have a good understanding of what kind of leases you all have. In addition to that, there's um, embedded leases, which Carrie mentioned a little bit. It's your typical, uh, what an embedded lease is, is a service contract with uh, the right of a use in that contract. Um, an example uh, may be if you have an IT contract, maybe there's a server dedicated for your company uh, okay. at a, you know, a data hub. Um, so therefore, that you are actually leasing mm-hmm. this tangible asset associated with um, it in that service contract. Okay. So after you kind of go through all your contracts, your leases and your contracts, um, there's a, there's some assumptions that are going to have to be made as well mm-hmm. um, in terms of getting all that, the key information needed to record the liability. And mm-hmm. some of those assumptions may be lease term. For example, um, you're on a year-to-year lease, but you expect to be in this building for another 10 years. Um, right. So management's assumption is that it's going to be a 10-year lease liability. So those are assumptions that need to be made up front. You know, and getting the information early on and working through CPAs is going to make the whole transition a lot easier. So even though you might, as you say, have an agreement that doesn't specify that, if in all for all intents and purposes and, and in practice, there's no easy way to just exit that building tomorrow. So you've got to essentially assume that, that, that it's a little bit different than yeah. what's stated. It's going to economically disrupt the business. And okay. that's also a consideration when reporting leases. Okay. Now, um, if, if I think through, okay, how do I then value these, these assets? So I have a right of use asset. You mentioned like if I'm part of a, a data hub or something, but yet I have all this stuff up in the cloud. So how do I, how do I value that? I mean, how do, you, how do you go about doing that? The value is really based on the present value of the payments. So okay. I know we don't have a whiteboard or a spreadsheet in front of us. Yeah. But one of the things that we've found out in doing this process of researching and finding ways for our clients uh, to easily do this process, there are software solutions out there so that that can really walk you through all the inputs, um, the terms related, um, the discount rates related to the present value of yeah. your payments. Because this could be all over the map, right? I'm All over the place. I'm an old finance guy, so I immediately went to discount rate and thinking, oh, that can just skew the value tremendously. Right? Yeah. And so with every input, discount rate, um, at least term, okay. there's a multitude of considerations. Okay. And so working with your CPA, finding a, a solution can help really simplify that process. Okay. So will we do that for clients then with, with some of the maybe software solutions that we've identified and say, okay, we can sort of do Yeah, in the last you. year, our group has demoed a few products out there. Mm-hmm. So we've demoed a few from a client-facing perspective, but we've also demoed one that we've settled on from a firm-facing mm-hmm. perspective mm-hmm. that will allow us to provide an additional service to our clients. Now, what about... Cody, can you talk a little bit about disclosures in the financial statements? Because that's, again, one of the first things you always go to. What are the disclosures and footnotes? Is that 
different, or what do we what do we see there? Absolutely. So with every uh, new county standard, there's another page of footnotes to add into the <laughs> financial statements. So, uh oh. Yeah. Um, it, the disclosures will be a little more detail on the type of leases, um, the information that Carrie mentioned, the lease terms, the discount rate, um, or used used by the company, um, just provide more background on the types of leases they have as well. Okay, so so definitely more detail there. Our clients are all privately held. We, we deal with uh, privately held companies of all sizes, a lot of closely held family businesses on the smaller side and some quite larger complex operations too. Are there differences that we see in terms of like materiality with regard to uh, these disclosures and things like that? Is that have an impact or or not so much. It's really kind of there's always insane. a materiality. We were talking earlier, and one of the examples that we've come up with a group. I mean, you can imagine, you know, let's just say you know, I have a manufacturing facility with multiple buildings in an area, and so mm -hmm. I just lease a golf cart to yeah. roam around. Well, that lease is most likely is going to be immaterial to that yeah. facility. Well, you take a country club who has 150 golf carts, right? Then they lease all of them. Well, that's going to be a materiality consideration for them. So even if it's the same type of lease, it can be completely two different conclusions for two different clients. What about, you know, I always tend to see folks go to the other side too, the potential for quote unquote gaming the system. Are you, are you seeing any yes. discussion there? Yes. What, what, could, what insight can you um, provide there, Karen? So one of the things that I, I had been asked that there are a few considerations or exclusions. So if you can determine that your lease is month to month mm -hmm. or it's less than 12 months, uh, you can just short-term lease and you don't have to report it. Okay. So they get the question, well, what if I can make my 20-year lease month to month? <laughs> well, is your intention month to month? Is your intention 20 years? So you're looking at that complete lease term yeah. rather than what's not what's necessarily written out in the agreement okay what's the intent are you going to renew and then you mentioned earlier the economic impact could they really exit that mm -hmm. arrangement without some economic hindrance yeah yeah so yeah. that that's a big part of it mm -hmm. too yeah i mean if it's going to cost you a material amount of money to relocate your manufacturing facility or to relocate your corporate offices then yeah. you've got to consider that you probably won't be exiting that lease anytime soon. And that, now, Cody, have you seen anything? I know we have lots of clients in, in different industries that have uh, vehicle fleets, you know, whether it's service repair or just for their, their folks to get out to different locations or things like that. Is there anything that you're aware of that you've seen with regard to how maybe vehicle fleets are arranged, those types of leasing arrangements, anything like that? Yes, there is. There's a, um, it's called a portfolio approach. Okay. Vehicle portfolio approach um, basically like um, assets under the same type like we mentioned the vehicles um, if they're all under the same terms um, you can calculate uh, a liability for that specific portfolio of, of assets okay so it, it does save some work on um, as opposed to entering a hundred a thousand cars right um, individually you can take an approach where you add um, one asset for the entire fleet of vehicles so it would be beneficial to, uh, if I'm a business owner, it'd be beneficial to me to have those under one type of program, as it were, rather than all these separate individual lease terms with different yeah. things, because it would make it obviously way easier to have it all under one. Correct. Mm -hmm. yep. So there's business considerations, too, to perhaps simplifying, making things more efficient that, that should be considered here. Yeah. Okay. Um, Carrie, are there any specific industries that you see more than any other being impacted here? I mean, we've talked about a lot of broad things, obviously, you know, manufacturing, construction. Um, what about distribution, wholesale, retail? I don't know. Well, restaurants. I okay. Mean, you talk about your, your franchises. Okay. Who are Good have, point. You know, leasing their property. Yeah. Um, definitely, you're not going to be exiting that corner of that intersection anytime soon <laughs> right that's a great place to have your business depend i mean it really i think it depends on the business too that you know if, if your business strategy is to purchase your assets mm -hmm. it's going to be a much different conclusion than what your business strategy is to lease your assets right it may may change your way of, of thinking mm -hmm. um are we seeing any noise out there in terms of 
for example, I think of equipment leasing companies. Uh, are they changing the way they, they do business or structure contracts at all? Have either of you heard anything about stuff like that? I have not heard anything, but in some of the discussions that I've had with other firms and how they're working with their clients is an accounting change is an accounting change. And we never, we don't want to see a business change their operations mm -hmm. if we can handle the accounting change on the backside. Right. So you want them to be able to run their operations still as efficiently and as well as they can. Um, and then as accountants, we'll, we'll handle the, yeah. the accounting changes and disclosures on the back end, but operators... Run do, your business. Do what you do. Yeah. And and I, I largely, I agree with you. I just, I think of some, for example, some construction equipment rental shops that I know, some of which are very substantial. And they, one of their points of sale would be to try to, in essence, structure these things as operating leases for mm -hmm. their customers so they wouldn't be put on balance sheet. Well, obviously, that goes out the window. Well, and I could also see as we go back and talk about the portfolio approach. Yeah. If, if that was one of your sales techniques to right. say, hey, if you lease multiple, yeah. have you considered portfolio approach? So I, you know. There you go. There's a benefit, right? <laughs> yeah. Do, take this whole fleet yes. right from us and, and, and it'll make your life life easier. So certainly a lot, lot to consider there. Um, now this was delayed, right? A, a year in mm -hmm. terms of implementation. So Cody, are you seeing anything that looks like it's going to change or, or this is definitely now going to be coming for any fiscal year after 12, 15, 20. I feel like they gave us our one break that we're going to get. Okay. Um, so I think it is going into effect after the 2020 year. So there's no more break. Now it's just giving the private companies a chance to really get their arms around the leases they have, the agreements they have, and um, take a very proactive approach, which is what we're doing here. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, you, you talked about, obviously, it's already in place for public companies, right? Yes. So we, we already know that, mm -hmm. how that works. Yeah, so we are able to see the disclosures that they've already have out there. One thing related to the delay, um, just to add to what Cody said, is that wasn't, FASB didn't say, okay, we're just delaying the lease standard. Mm -hmm. But they made a recommendation, and they approved this, that I believe it's all pronouncements, it will be a two-year gap mm. between implementation from public companies to private companies. Oh. Great. So this is really something that's going to benefit private companies in the long run to yeah. be able to see the effects on the examples from the public companies. That's great. Would have been nice to have that with revenue recognition. <laughs> <laughs> sure would have. Yeah, we got on we got on the right resource team, I think. Yeah, so. exactly. Now I know neither of you are are tax experts per se, but have is there any what what kind of noise are you hearing from the tax side in terms of potential impact? I mean Obviously, now we could have a difference between, say, book and tax representation. What, what do you see? Do you yeah. have any insights into any that? Any insight there? I do not think there is any difference. Okay. Um, I think it's going to be excluded from tax, so it's going to be adjustment um, on the return to okay. remove any asset or liability. Okay. So we'll defer discussion of yeah. that yeah. for, I'm not for, even for expertise, that. right? I know enough to be dangerous <laughs> with the taxes, but again, it just points out to the fact that this stuff gets ever more complex mm -hmm. and you need to talk to your partners. Yeah, right? absolutely. Involve involve your best people around you and make the right decisions and get the processes in place. So if I'm a business owner, where do I start by talking to my CPA and just say, hey, can you give me some assessment as to what impact this might have on my business? Is that a that's, fair? Yeah, that's very fair. I think just start the conversation. Like we said, with the delay, you know, don't, don't waste that one year. Um, yeah start it now, um, then you have no surprises coming up. Because like Cody said, there, this is not going away. And so those are the conversations we're trying to have with our clients, yeah. right? As mm -hmm. we go through um, the beginning of busy season here and mm -hmm. into the, the meat of that, and we're doing the field work, we want to be out there. Hey, let's think about this now. What do we do this year to, to help prep you for this? Yeah, start having those conversations, getting any of those least agreements together, seeing what they may or may have not yet done. And they have a chance then this year to maybe do some things that can make it easier for them. Yeah. Right? yeah. So we can we can help guide those those discussions too. Yeah, absolutely. So, well, thank you both for being here and providing some insight on that. Um, Carrie, I'm sorry we don't have 
three tigers here. For I know. Us. So I was so we, disappointed. Wish we did. I didn't think ahead. Oh. So shout out to our our favorite Granville haunt. Uh, for those of you who may know it, we'll just have to go there directly from here. Yes, later. <laughs> Um, anyhow, if you want more business tips and insight or to hear previous episodes of Unsuitable, visit our podcast page at www.raycpa.com slash podcast. Thanks for listening to this week's show. You can subscribe to Unsuitable on iTunes or wherever you like to get your podcasts, including YouTube. I'm Doug Hauser. Join us next week for another Unsuitable interview from industry professionals.